Good morning, everyone. My name is Braxton Bridgers, and I'm a Millennial Public Policy Fellow working with the Resource Security Program here at New America. On behalf of my cohort and program, thank you for attending our spring symposium. A quick bit of housekeeping before we begin. Directly after this session, we will have lunch provided. I'm really excited about that. I don't know about you guys. <laughs> um, so please feel free to grab some food and mix and mingle with us Millennial Fellows and New America staff. My cohort and I are really excited to host discussions around some of the most pressing issues that our generation and future generations are expected to face. One such issue is identifying the role of big data and technology in the policymaking process, whether it be in building government service platforms with a user-centered design or analyzing trends in user behavior on social media platforms to counter violent and extremist rhetoric both big data and technology have the ability to spark the creation of innovative and effective policies. During this session, our expert panelists will explore ways in which data and technology can be used to strengthen policy, as well as examine the challenges associated with data and technology-driven policy making. We'll have conversations in three rounds. Our first discussion features Millennial Fellow Emma Coleman in conversation with public interest technology and Open Technology Institute Fellow Dapayan Ghosh. Emma and Dapayan will discuss the utility in having technologists at the policymaking table, drawing from Dapayan's experience as a technologist in the public policy space. Next, Millennial Fellows Spandy Singh and New America International Security Fellow Ivana Hu will discuss the challenges encountering violent extremism online. And last but not least, Millennial Fellow Dylan Rosine will host a conversation with New America Cybersecurity Fellow Robert Lord and Public Interest Technology Fellow Sonia Sakar around the benefits and risk of healthcare data with a focus on patient privacy and security. But before we dive into these important conversations, Cecilia Munoz, Vice President of Public Interest Technology and Public Interest at New America, will provide remarks regarding the role of data and technology in policy. Before joining New America, Cecilia served on President Obama's senior staff, first as Director of Intergovernmental Affairs for three years, followed by five years as Director of the Domestic Policy Council. Prior to her work in government, she served for 20 years at the National Council of La Raza, now Unidos US, the nation's largest Hispanic policy and advocacy organization, where she was Senior Vice President for the Office of Research, Advocacy, and Legislation. She received a MacArthur Fellowship in 2000 for her work on immigration and civil rights and serves on the boards of the Open Society and Kresge Foundations, as well as the nonprofit United to Protect Democracy. Please join me in welcoming to the stage Cecilia Munoz. Thank you very much, Brexton. Uh, still morning, right? Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm really excited to do this. I'm really excited to be here in part because uh, I'm pretty thrilled about the Millennial Fellows program here at New America. Emma Coleman, who you will hear from in a moment, is has been working in particular with the public interest tech team. But as I have gotten to know the fellows and the work that they're doing across our components, it's just a, quite an extraordinary group of people um, and more importantly, an inspiring group of people. And, and I just am one of many across the institution that have been really inspired by their presence here and the work that we get to do together. So thank you for that. Um, and thank you all of you for being here. So as you heard, I'm a civil rights person. I, I spent 20 years in the civil rights movement before I went into government. And um, it's the combination of those experiences which brought me to doing public interest technology at New America. And I'm just gonna outline that for a minute to sort of set up the panels which are going to come. Um, but that context is really relevant because I, I don't start out thinking of myself as a technologist. I've discovered as I have learned about how this works and I learned about it from the experience of being in government. At the Domestic Policy Council, I sat at the intersection between the sort of policy nerds, which is what I am, the policy teams working on a variety of issues, solving a variety of different problems, and this thing that we created, the US Digital Service, where we brought in hotshot technologists from the Silicon Valley, we recruited them to do two-year tours of duty, sort of Peace Corps style, to help us in the work of solving public problems. And I got to help place these tech teams, which seemed to have magical powers because they knew stuff that I didn't feel like I knew, um, with 
policy nerds like me who like didn't really get why we needed him to sit down with a product developer or an engineer. And when you got these different kinds of problem solvers sitting at a table together trying to solve problems, it was not just magical to sort of watch it happen, but it was transformative. And the insight that I picked up from that experience coming from the world that I come from is that the civil rights world that I come from, the NGO world that many of us support that we are indeed part of here at New America, we need the same capacity. We need that, those, those same transformative skills to solve the public problems that we try to solve. So I came out of that experience feeling like the way in the future that we're going to be protecting voting rights, the way that we're going to be solving homelessness, the way we're going to be addressing income disparities in the future, all of those are going to involve data and all of those are going to involve technology. And in most cases, we just haven't figured out how that's going to work yet. But uh, we must, um, uh, because we count on the institutions of civil society in this country to help us identify when disparities are happening and to help us identify what to do about them, right? That's what the civil rights world is about. That's what it's for. We pass statutes that give us the tools to hopefully get in front of discrimination before it happens, but certainly to address it after it happens. Those tools are imperfect tools, but they are sacred. They're important. The way we protect voting rights mostly in this country is through litigation on the Voting Rights Act, which was passed 50 years ago, which has been weakened by the Supreme Court recently. And it's not, it was never a perfect tool. It's not going to become a more perfect tool in the future. We need additional tools. And we live at a time in which uh, technology is transforming everything about the way that we live and work. It's trans, it's right, we're in this moment where we're in conversations about the future of work. We are in conversations about the um, strength and the capacity of the platforms that probably everybody in this room uses to advance our connection to people, but also to potentially undermine and corrode some of the institutions of our democracy. Everything is on the table. Everything is changing. And the question that we're asking here at New America and with partners around the country is, how do we make sure we are leveraging those tools to solve our public problems, to make sure that they are in the hands of the institutions that we count on to identify when there's a problem and to help us steer towards solutions to those problems. So just to give you, uh, you know, a, 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 one of the many negative examples that, um, that are circulating, we know, for example, that um, we can be perpetuating some of our biases, some of the things which create inequalities lead to disparities um, through algorithms, right? That we may end up creating structures which perpetuate some of the things which have created inequities in this country, right? We, again, we count on civil rights institutions, we count on the institutions of civil society to help us figure out when that's happening uh, and to help us fix it, help us get in front of it before it happens, even better still. The civil rights institutions largely are not living and working and operating in a tech environment. They don't necessarily have those skill sets on their teams. They're not necessarily, they are thinking about the problems. They're not necessarily leveraging the right skill sets to help get in front of them and to help us resolve them. That's something that we want to change by building tech capacity into that work. But I also want to make sure to give you a positive example because um, uh, we think we've, we are starting to go down the road about thinking about this in terms of uh, the potential dangers, and those are very real. It's important to understand what they are. But it is also true that we can be leveraging these same tools to solve public problems. So a, m a modest example from, um, from the city of New Orleans, which leveraged data. They figured out you can use data to figure out when a ho where and when a house fire is likely to happen in the city of New Orleans or anywhere in this country. You can figure that out through zoning, through the kinds of buildings that you have by past history of house fires, there is data that you can leverage to figure out which parts of the city are more susceptible to have a house fire, which is not only costly in terms of property, but costs us lives. And by using that data, they transformed what fire departments usually across the country do, which is that they do outreach and get people smoke detectors. right? So the typical way of doing outreach is to kind of get out there, use access to media, go out and speak to schools, like hopefully try to find the people who need this information and that need smoke detectors and hopefully get them in the hands of the right folks. But by using data, the fire department was able to target 
neighborhoods where deadly house fires were more likely to happen. And what did they do? Their outreach strategy was to go knock on those doors and help people install the, the smoke detectors. And in the first quarter after instituting that policy, they were able to prevent what could have been a, a deadly house fire. Right? They got the information, the smoke detector worked, they were able to stop the for fire before people died. Um, so we can be leveraging data and technology affirmatively to get in front of problems before they happen as well. There is as much positive potential as there is negative potential. But the thing we have to do is make sure that there are technologists working in these fields, working in city governments, working for the federal government, and working on the teams with NGOs. There are lots of good people in the tech world who are, who are smart, they're problem solvers, they're thinkers, and they believe they have the solutions to potentially every problem. And maybe they do. But what I can tell you for sure is that they don't always fully understand the problems that they would be seeking to solve, right? There's lots of people who think you can build an app that can solve any problem. I'm pretty sure that's not how we're going to solve our problems. But I have witnessed what happens when you sit technologists down with the doers at the Department of Education to create policies that are transformative or, and tools that can have the potential to transform the way people access higher education in this country. I've seen that happen. And I have seen the, um, the, the light in the eyes of technologists who realize that uh, how much meaning there is in public service and how extraordinarily rewarding it is to be tackling some of the big pro public problems that we face. So what we are hoping to create here is a field of public interest technology so that you know, somebody who is deciding to how, how they're going to pursue a career is interested in data, is maybe interested in engineering, can be thinking about getting that training so that they can go solve homelessness, or getting that training so that they can be as addressing disparities in the healthcare system. That's the world that we're trying to create here. We're very, I feel incredibly lucky to have been able to bring that passion to building a team of public interest technologists uh, here at New America and a team that's working to build a field of public interest technology. You're going to meet some members of that team, including our millennial fellow, Emma Coleman, uh, in some really fascinating and important discussions about how we leverage these tools, what kind of public problems we need to be attacking, and how we're going to be building this world together. So I couldn't be more excited to have all of you here and on with the conversation. Thank you. Well, thank you for that introduction, Cecilia, and thank you, Braxton, as well. Hi, everyone. My name is Emma Coleman, and I'm the Millennial Fellow in the Public Interest Technology Program. I'm joined today on stage by Depayan Ghosh, who is both a Public Interest Technology Fellow and an Open uh, Technology Institute Fellow as well. And he focuses mainly on privacy, security, and civil rights policy. So before uh, Depine came to New America, he worked at both Facebook uh, and at the White House as a technology policy advisor. And uh, his most recent work has been Digital Deceit, examining the technologies behind precision propaganda and political inf disinformation on the internet, in which he explored election meddling and disinformation campaigns across social media. So thank you for being here, Depine. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I'd love to start off our conversation. You've worked in this space for a long time. Why is there an urgency now to incorporate technologists into the policymaking process? Well, I think that, uh, I think as Cecilia was just saying, we are seeing technology really come to the fore across society. When we um, are trying to read the latest news, we, we turn to our phone. When we try to hail a cab, we turn to, to Uber or Lyft. Um, when we try to uh, find the, the nearest gas station, we're, we're turning to an app again. Um, and so it crea has created so much opportunity, economic opportunity, uh, across the board and, and has um, created the, the platform that we really turn to every day um, for every single, every single thing that we try to do. Um, but I think at the same time, as, as Cecilia was also saying, um, the use of technology uh, across society has, has really raised a lot of, uh, a lot of concerns um, and has raised a lot of really difficult tensions that uh, we need to navigate in the way forward. And so I think um, technologists 
have to increasingly be at the table, both to figure out ways to leverage technology in the in the in the to its highest potential, um, but also to to help remind us that there is a there is a darker side too, uh, and there's an underbelly that uh, we we need to address and and we need to really try to um, work around um, so that many of the tensions that we've seen thus far uh, can, can be avoided in the future. And I know that you've worked in several capacities in terms of as an advisor on these types of things and now you're doing uh, more research and writing. What would be the best way to go about incorporating technologists? Is it to bring them into elected officials' offices? Is it to teach elected officials how to even understand some of the more complicated uh, elements of technological learning that we have now, such as machine learning or algorithmic discrimination or anything like that? I think it's all of it. I think you, you raise a couple of really great examples. We have, uh, we have the Tech Congress Initiative, uh, which, which aims to actually place uh, smart te technologists into uh, offices on the Hill. Um, and we have several colleagues of ours that, that are doing exactly that in, in leading offices on the Hill. Um, that is important because uh, we, we saw just the other day um, a, a set of hearings that, um, you know, I, I, think, I think members try their best to, to understand all the issues at, at hand, but of course sometimes there are gaps and they're not technologists all the time. Um, in fact, very few are, are technologists. It, it helps to have a staffer who, who is a technologist and who can raise uh, these important issues in the right way and, and can understand these issues and, and navigate around them. Um, so I think, uh, I think the, the goal is really to bring that expertise closer to the decision-making table. Now, everybody has constraints. Of course, members on the Hill have constraints. They have, uh, they have, a, they have a set budget and they can't hire everyone in the world. And of course, I'm sure they would love to have a civil rights expert and a technology expert and um, a health policy expert. And, and many of those are roles that are, that are filled um, in, in many offices. But everybody has constraints. So I think we just need to figure out ways to um, bring technology as close to the decision-making process as possible, especially given its really central role across business functions and our livelihoods and our, um, our social life. Mm -hmm. And I know now you're working on an anthology around machine learning to sort of educate policymakers. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, um, this is, this is uh, really about one of the issues that Cecilia had mentioned, um, that of algorithmic discrimination and algorithmic bias. Um, and as a, as a uh, related issue, um, addressing ethics as artificial intelligence comes to the fore. Um, algorithms are used across society uh, in almost every, every app that we use, every um, decision-making process um, that, that the business world engages in, whether it's uh, determinations of creditworthiness or um, routing uh, a car through traffic most effectively or um, making decisions about federal housing and, and public policy. Um, these are all decisions that are increasingly driven by algorithms. And as artificial intelligence comes to the fore, those algorithms are getting smarter and smarter and being trained on more and more histor historical data to drive um, basically the corporate sector and the government, whoever is housing those algorithms and trying to implement them, um, to, to greater efficiency, that is, to greater profit. Um, what we need to make sure, though, is of course that as those algorithms are being developed and implemented, uh, we stay grounded and we respect civil rights law. We respect um, ethical frameworks, whatever the, whatever the context might be, um, and, and don't make decisions that can lead to enormous disparities uh, across society in ways that can really, really be damaging and hurtful to many, many people. Um, because that has happened in the past. Uh, it, it, it really needs to stop. Um, and I, I, think we, I think we need to bring ethics into the development of, of algorithms in a, in a much bigger way, in a much more um, 
concerted way, starting from that decision-making table. Um, and so this an anthology is, is really about trying to raise some of the biggest ideas uh, across the country and, and around the world in this area and give experts a voice as to how artificial intelligence and algorithms raise uh, ethical concerns in different spaces and what can be done about, uh, about those, those issues. And your other recent paper, uh, Digital Deceit, uh, which looks at the tools that are used to spread disinformation, uh, you suggest that re the resulting ad tech policy should center on three main areas, which is election law, privacy regulations, and consumer protection law. When you have these global platforms like Facebook and you're, you're asking for these sorts of changes, how do policy changes in one country affect such a broad problem? Does it need to be that technologists in, across the world or in multiple countries are coming together to work on these policies? Yeah, absolutely. You're spot on in that analysis. Um, these are global platforms. They raise global societal tensions. And so we need global collaboration to, to address those problems. Um, I think, I think in this case, uh, that paper which I which I collaborated on with uh, with Ben Scott, a senior advisor at New America, uh, is our our goal is really to make one central point, which is that the leading digital platforms of the day, whether it's Facebook or Google or or Twitter or any of the other leading internet companies, um, are are really premised on one function which serves, which contributes to more than 95% of their, their revenue, uh, which is targeted advertising. Um, it's a space that, it, it's a space that doesn't really have much regulation right now. In the, in the United States, we have um, the Federal Trade Commission, which is charged to try to police it, but they don't, uh, they don't have much authority in the space. Um, and there aren't any other federal agencies that, that have much authority. And so the business community, uh, the industry, um, has almost grown like photosynthesis toward the light of um, the practices that, that can bring them highest profit margin. And that whole business model is really premised on creating a, an extremely compelling services that, uh, that are borderline addictive. Um, uh, collecting as much data as possible about individual people through those services and creating opaque algorithms to, to try to target ads at those people. And there's, because there's no regulation in this space, uh, they've grown in this direction um, in, a, in a huge way. Um, for example, Facebook's, Facebook's revenues 10 years ago were $3 billion, and, and today they're $43 billion. Um, and... Uh, around that time of a few years ago, that is when they introduced all their uh, tremendous ad targeting technologies. Um, I think that the solution really lies in understanding that business model, uh, both here and around the world, and trying to address it by listening to the, listening to the global community's uh, concerns. And that's something that the industry is, is trying to do more and more. Um, but it really lies in global collaboration with, with Europe, with Japan and Korea, with uh, India, with Brazil and Argentina, as they also consider da data protection regimes. Um, there is a big conversation that's starting now in, in, on Capitol Hill about a data protection regime here as well. And I think moving forward, this will really require global collaboration because Regulation in the United States does not necessarily mean regulation in India or Brazil. Um, and these are global platforms. They're not just US companies anymore. And as you mentioned, Facebook has seen incredible growth over the past 10 years that you know, no one would have necessarily expected at the beginning. How do we end up creating policies that are agile enough to adjust for how fast new services tend to come on the market? I love this question because in the U.S., we actually have a very rigid regulatory regime. The two agencies that, that oversee tech and telecom are, are the Federal Communications Commission and the Trade Commission. And it, th there's almost a waterfall effect of, um, you know, depending on who is in, in power, Democrats or Republicans, 
the regulatory regime is, is either here or it's here. And uh, when the politics changes, it moves back to step one, when, and then when it changes again, it moves back to step two, and there's really no certainty, there's no consistency, and we just really need more agile regulation um, that, can, that can address the harms that, and the benefits that, uh, that, the, that the sector um, germinates and, and, and creates. Um, I think it, it will require more advocacy. It'll require more events like the Cambridge Analytica News, frankly. It, it, will, in, it, it will require the public sentiment shifting um, to understand that this is how the business model works and this is how it can create tensions across society. Um, and as such, we need to rethink the way that we oversee the industry. Um, now, that's not to say that, that we need to implement strict and stringent regulations against everybody, but, but we do need to give the government a little bit more agency in understanding how the sector works and, uh, and addressing it. And how have you seen that change over time, both during your time at Facebook and during your time at the White House? Honestly, I, I haven't seen the regulatory regime change all that much. Um, so I think the biggest example of an attempt at changing it was with the net neutrality uh, announcement. Um, briefly, net neutrality is the idea of treating every bit that travels over the internet the same. So you can't engage in paid prioritization or blocking or throttling of content. You need transparency on the internet connection. Those are some of the elements of President Obama's um, idea for what net neutrality should look like. Um, and what he tried to do, or what he, what he actually advocated was that um, telecom providers should be reclassified uh, under how the Federal Communications Commission uh, considers them providers of an information service versus uh, a more utility-like service. And he, he advocated that the, the, the Federal Communication, Communications Commission's chairman at the time, uh, Tom Wheeler, actually proposed that they do get reclassified. That's been, that was brought back, that, that was brought back under the Trump FCC pretty quickly. Um, and uh, that's, that I think was the biggest attempt that we've seen at trying to legislate or regulate this. There have been a lot of legislative efforts, but they, they haven't really moved forward through committee either. So I see it uh, as, on the Hill, it's a lot of advocacy, uh, trying to um, bring public sentiment um, a little bit further. Um, and in the administration, you know, I see, I see attempts one way or the other to, um, uh, to try to have an impact on, on regulation, but I think we, Again, we just need to think about the public sentiment. Uh, there needs to be better public education on how technology works uh, to get us over that hump of political gridlock. And how do you think the most recent uh, big news stories around tech policy, so net neutrality and then Zuckerberg's testimony before Congress, have impacted public sentiment and then will in turn impact the regulatory side? Well, uh, we, we just saw, I think in the past day, Facebook's revenue grow by 63% by over the quarter. So, um, you know, I think, I think public sentiment is, is still pretty high in general. It's, it's almost like a filter bubble, as Cecilia was alluding to. There is a, um, there's a conversation that's happening amongst DC tech policy people, but but there needs to be a broader sense of how things should change for the sector, how the government should, should be more agile in responding to it. Um, I think that the public sentiment has shifted a little bit, but only a little bit um, uh, in general, because we might, we might think that it's shifted a lot based on everything that we read in the New York Times and everything that's, that's being said uh, on, in, in different forums about the sector. But I think the average American consumer still uses Facebook every day and still will for the foreseeable future and, and has a high affinity to all these platforms. As a matter of fact, I think it was just reported through a Wall Street Journal poll last week that most Americans think that we have enough regulation of the sector already 
um, or that we have too much regulation in the sector. So, um, so I think I think it'll require a little bit more uh, umph. Mm -hmm. And as we sort of create these policies and move forward, how do we create that collaboration between public sector and private sector, uh, between the government and between these large companies, when so often they're demonized um, in the news and for justifiable reasons, but still in a way that we need to have them in this collaborative process? Yeah, I mean, they are demonized. And news reports, we have to remember that, that uh, you know, not, not to cast aspersions or anything, but we do have to remember that the business model of tech implicates the business model of journalism and, and news. And so there is, a, there is a hard tension between those two industries right now. And so a lot of the reports that we might see might not always tell both sides of the story as, as well as they could. Um, many of them do, but, but many of them don't. And so I think... Uh, I think we just need uh, a better representation of technologists and everybody in the sector, uh, sorry, in the, in, the, in, the, um, in the universe of this conversation, all the stakeholders at play, we need them at the table. Um, Facebook actually, uh, Facebook, Google, Twitter, they, they do have, they are global platforms and there are many, many um, minor and major implications of any public policy change that they might make. Um, and we don't always see it unless unless we are, you know, working there or talking to, to folks who are there. It's it's often hard to see how a change here or a change in policy uh, in, in in the company's privacy policy might impl implicate uh, the global usership in ways that we might not have foreseen. And once we, you know, hopefully have these evolved policies that better protect uh, consumers, what does the technologist's place in enforcement look like? Well, in enforcement, we actually have a couple of good examples. One um, I'll just mention is the CTO at the Federal Trade Commission. Um, we've had a, a series of really brilliant people in that role, um, from Harvard professors to Princeton professors to... Uh, the chief technology uh, technology officer. Um, actually, I think in this case it was it was not the CTO. The, the title was actually the the principal technologist. I might be wrong about that, but um, some some really amazing people have had that role, and that is an important role because the Federal Trade Commission, which is headed by a, a chair man or chairwoman, and has four other commissioners who all vote on, um, on a proceeding or a regulation moving forward or a, an enforcement action, for example, um, they are, they're typically lawyers or, or policy experts, um, but, but don't have a broad understanding of or a deeper understanding of technology. And of course, technology is defining a lot of the, the agency's priorities now um, because of implications around privacy and security and communication. Um, and, and so the principal technologist at the agency advises the commission and, and, the, and the chairperson. Um, and that really helps the agency be incisive and understand industry practices to a much greater degree than they otherwise would, would be able to. And having that person internally really helps because it, it allows them to trust um, the recommendations that are coming forward as opposed to having a narrow influence actor uh, telling the agency what it should or should not do. Um, so I think, I think that is one good example of how bringing a technologist into, the, into an agency or into an organization can drive a discussion as to what priorities it should take on. Great. Well, thank you so much for your insight, uh, and we'll welcome the next panel onto the stage. Thanks. Thank bye. You. everyone. Thank you so much for being here. My name is Spandy, and I'm a pu uh, Millennial Public Policy Fellow at New America's Open Technology Institute. I'm very excited to be joined here today by Ivana Hu, 
Ivana is a New America Fellow on the International Security Program, and she's also the CEO and a partner at Omalas. Omalas is a machine learning and data analytics firm that seeks to automate, quantify, and standardize approaches to countering violent extremism, or CVE. Ivana has done a lot of really awesome work around the world, and it's kind of hard to condense it all, but um, just a, a couple of amazing points. She's um, interviewed a number of former extremists around the world from groups like Hezbollah, ISIS, AKY, and t the Taliban. And she's also participated in a number of de-radicalization programs with neo-Nazis in Scandinavia. Um, so I'm really excited to be joined um, with her today. And today we're going to be talking about how can we improve the space of CVE um, by including data and by using data. Um, and to give you a little bit of background on sort of this conversation, through the fellowship I've been writing a paper that looks at what are the challenges involved when it comes to evaluating um, CVE approaches that are implemented by technology companies. Um, and I found that a lot of it is related to a lack of metrics, a lack of data, and a lack of clear definitions in the space. And as you know, um, companies like Facebook and Twitter and Google have come under a lot of pressure um, over the uh, last couple of years to take down content and to do it um, in a more quick manner. And, and this has sometimes translated into legislation. So like at the beginning of 2018, uh, Germany instituted the Network Enforcement Act, which mandates that companies have to remove content um, within 24 hours of it being flagged, and they have to remove harmful content, which includes extremist content. Otherwise, they will face fines. And so there's a lot of growing pressure, but there's no real proof that these approaches work. Um, and so this is sort of what we're going to be talking about today. So um, to kick it off, Ivana, you've worked in the CVE space for a really long time, and you've worked at this intersection of CVE data and technology. Can you talk a little bit about the challenges that you face when it comes to evaluating CVE programs um, and how Omalas has worked with this? Yeah, so I'll start with uh, the challenges. I think the first is it's really hard to measure the lack of something, right? Because CVE comes left a boom, right, before stuff blows up. And so with the Pentagon, where your mission is lethality, you can say um, a drone took out five uh, bad guys and 10 civilians, and because of that, X, Y, and Z happened with the network. But with CVE, you don't really, it's really hard to say, oh yeah, well, this person, because of the work that we did, this person decided not to join ISIS or Al-Qaeda or a neo-Nazi group, unless... You know, it's a very, um, it's timed so well that you have managed to actually disrupt a plot that was happening, and then you can count the plot, right? Uh, and so I think that's the first challenge. And the second is also just, it's the mentality in the space, is government is not used to measuring anything. <laughs> it's, and when they do, they look at cl like uh, click-through rates. They look at shares and likes. I don't actually know what any of those things mean, right? Because we don't know if they lead to any kind of change in behaviors. They're just numbers. And there's an interesting stat that 70% of people who share links on Facebook with their friends were on their news feed. They don't actually read the, uh, the article. They just read the title. And then you, and, and that also causes other problems like fake news and all that stuff, but that's a different conversation. Um, so the way that we're looking at it at Omalas is we said, okay, how do you actually measure the radicalization level of groups of people? Uh, we really don't go down to the individual level because people change and people are fundamentally irrational, especially when they're emotional. And so we look at the group data. So we're, So what we're saying is, Right now, the way that these things are measured is someone's walking around with a clipboard in Kabul or even within the Somali American communities in the US, and they're asking, how do you feel about joining Al-Shabaab? Most people are not going to be like, yes, I really want to join Al-Shabaab, right? They're, gonna, they're, they're going to tell you uh, what they think you want to hear. But that's basically lies. And then we start thinking, OK, online, people tend to be more truthful. And they're probably a bit more radical online than they are in real life because there's a screen separating them from the online environment. But that probably gives us a better data source 
than walking around with a clipboard or doing it by polling or any of the other options that we have so far. So we started to look at, okay, where are the narratives that they're talking about? Um, can we actually start to match the online behaviors of people uh, as compared to the online behaviors of known violent extremists? Um, so these are people who are, you know, we don't care about extremists, we care about the people who are going to become violent extremists. Um, and so we started to use machine learning and create this really cool algorithm that gives you a score at the end, and that's what we use to measure. So when you're sending out a, a counter messaging campaign or when you want to look at the local narratives um, that people are saying about the US or about ISIS or any of the groups, um, you can just sort of use our dashboard and organically track what they're saying online. And when we talk about metrics and definitions in the space, um, this is something that's come up in the conversation quite recently, like over the last couple of years. Um, but companies and you know, organizations that work in CVE haven't really implemented this um, quite enough. So just as a couple of examples, um, this week Facebook uh, put up a blog post that provided an update on their CVE and their takedown work. And in it, they said that they were still working on defining their metrics. Um, and they're defining metrics for programs that they've run for years now. And it's kind of concerning that they don't actually know how to measure this. Similarly, a couple of months ago, um, some of the major internet platforms testified in DC um, about their CVE work. And uh, the Twitter representative was asked about metrics. And he kind of just gave a vague answer and was like, we're, we're working on it. Um, so it kind of seems like you know they spent a lot of money, spent a lot of resources to create these programs, but haven't really pro um, paid any attention to what actually works. So what do you think are the challenges that are associated with establishing metrics in the space? Like, why, why, why are there no metrics right now? Um, is it just people don't care, haven't really thought about it, or are there actually hurdles to creating them? Or taking down content? Taking down content and CVE in general. Okay. Um, I think for a lot of the tech giants, uh, it's not really in their interest. They're basically meeting the threshold that the government has put in front of them. And just speaking very frankly, if you have watched the Facebook um, hearings with Mark Zuckerberg, it's glaringly clear that our policymakers at the highest level don't understand technology. They don't understand technology, not even talking about AI, which got flung around like, I don't know what, like they, they did not understand it. And the hearing, it actually missed the entire point of why Mark Zuckerberg was called, is like that was a national security threat and they made it into something completely different. And so I think it's um, technical illiteracy on behalf of the policymakers and because of that, they're, the, metrics that the metrics that they're giving to these tech companies um, are, are just not sufficient. And so it's not that they don't exist, they just really suck. Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> and so when we think about um, companies and governments operating unproven CVE programs, can you talk a little bit about the consequences that this can have on people both online and offline? I think the worst consequence is having a backlash, uh, meaning that the CVE programs typically are done with very good intentions. They're implemented by people who really care. Um, and yet, there's a backlash effect that it actually further radicalizes the exact group of people that they're trying to help. Um, DARPA did a, pre, a study on the effectiveness of the redirect method done by Jigsaw, which was Google Ideas. And what they found was that this program which has been written up by every single newspaper um, as this is the way forward in tackling online radicalization, they found that there was a backlash effect and that it further radicalized people um, who received the content through Google. But we don't really talk about that either, right? Um, and, and you sort of see the same thing in places in Pakistan and that's why a lot of successful CVE programs are not branded as CVE. They're branded under community resilience or agricultural livelihood um, or something that's completely different, even though you know, the actual mission of the program, it, it, it's to decrease the number of um, push factors. Yeah. 
Definitely. And I mean, when you talk about content takedowns, like a lot of the criticism that you receive is that running an unproven content takedown strategy can actually censor, um, you know, censor legitimate voices and that pushes them to be further marginalized and radicalized. Actually, can well. I add something to that? Sure. So it's interesting because um, we, uh, I actually sat on the same stage with a UK home secretary who has been super gun ho about taking down content. And I asked a question, I said, you know, Taking down content is getting, it's the topical way that we're trying to fix a problem, but it doesn't fix the underlying problems of why people in the UK are actually joining these programs. She didn't like the question very much. Um, but I mean, I think that's, uh, taking down content also has the unintended consequences that if human, right, human rights abuses were, were, were um, war crimes actually get scrubbed off the internet because from, a, a, from an AI perspective, they look the same. Mm -hmm. And so you know, I have talked to the International Criminal Court and I talked to a lot of the nonprofits that are gathering evidence against ISIS to try to prosecute them if a war tri tribunal actually happens, and, and that's their biggest thing, is you know, YouTube is taking down all the evidence. So what do we actually have now to prosecute anyone? Yeah, definitely. Um, and so a number of these platforms also focus on the big groups, so the Islamic State, Al-Qaeda, but there's a lot of concern because obviously these are not the only extremist groups that exist. And um, you know, some experts have said that by only focusing on these groups and only strategically dedicating your resources to these groups, you're letting these smaller groups gain a presence online, engage, and then they can, like in a world where there's no ISIS or no Al Qaeda anymore, they would become ISIS 2.0 and they would become ISIS 3.0. So can you talk a little bit more about, um, do you think companies should be more strategic in their approaches? Do you think they need to dedicate all their resources to only these big groups? I think the big groups are easy because there's not, there's not a lot of controversy about the fact that they're terrorist groups. But if you look at other groups like the PKK, if you're Turkey, it's a terrorist group. For anyone else, it's just a guerrilla group, right? Um, and, and so I think it is much easier to focus um, on, on these groups like I, ISIS, and to a certain extent, some neo-Nazi stuff have been taken, had, has been taken, taken down. Um, but yeah, they're definitely mis missing the boat. And even with Al-Qaeda, with all this new attention turned on ISIS for the past couple of years, what we have seen on our platform is that Al-Qaeda propaganda has risen significantly. Um, telegram channels for ISIS have been taken down, but Al-Qaeda in Syria, Hatash, I mean, any of their affiliates, they're just, it's like the Wild West for them because they know that they're not going to be taken down. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so when we think about companies reporting data on their CVE, um, when it comes to content takedowns, the real way that they do this is through transparency reports or through blog post updates. Um, when we talk about counter narratives, like you mentioned Jigsaw's project, there's not a lot of data disclosure that's going on in that, in that realm. How do you think companies can you know, improve on that? Do you think they should issue transparency reports similarly for these kinds of programs? Or do you think that um, you know, companies shouldn't be the main sources of data and we should rely on things like OMALAS instead to um, do that kind of evaluation? I think the incentives, the incentive structure is a little bit mis is skewed right now. It's not the, you know, you can say I've taken down 10,000 pieces of content or 10,000 accounts, um, but we don't really know what that means because it could also just mean that um, ISIS immediately created another 15,000, mm -hmm. right? So what's the actual environment like? And I think you do need someone objective who's not getting paid either by the government or by, by the tech companies to basically be like a special auditor or like an independent, aud aud yeah, something like that. Um, and then going back to Jigsaw, what's interesting to me is that the most sophisticated metric that we have that's widely accepted um, within counter narratives until maybe a year or two ago was a click-through rate. And Jigsaw is its internal think tank at Google. But 
if you're a client for Google advertising like Expedia or anyone like that, and you walked in to the client with a click-through rate, they will literally laugh you out, out of the room. And so we have a lot of people who come from Google advertising who work for my company, and they specifically said, if you don't have anything more sophisticated than you know, the lifetime value over the average cu customer acquisition cost of a campaign, like there's no way you're going to land that account and you will most likely be fired. And so you have this very interesting juxtaposition of like the bar of mm -hmm. expectations and yeah. Okay, great. And so I think we're almost out of time. So as a last question, what do you think the next steps in this space are? How can we use data to make CVE more meaningful and who should be the real stakeholders who are doing this? Ooh. Um, <laughs> I actually want to see civil society step up a little bit. Um, we do some work with civil societies who, um, who get money from U the U.S. government because they're more credible voices than the government itself. And um, I really want to see that they get their skin in the game in terms of helping us come up with these metrics and also be a little bit more literate in talking about it. <laughs> Because uh, we do a, we have to do a lot of education with them first, um, and then I think I mean, in terms of the government, the Global Engagement Center at State just got a lot. Finally, they got their money, mm -hmm. and so they now can actually do something. And I want them to instead of leaving the monitoring and evaluation to sort of this last thing that needs to get done is you know when you're actually thinking about and giving pe giving vendors money to create the content is you actually start to talk about m and &E, like right there. Because it's really hard to run an m and &E if you don't have a baseline in the beginning. And I think that nuance um, still needs to be further emphasized. Great. Um, with that, I think that's all the questions we have. So thank you very much for all being here. Good afternoon, everybody. I think enough time has passed since Cecilia's good morning that we can actually say good afternoon safely. Uh, I have the somewhat and sometimes unenviable task of being the moderator of the session right before lunch, uh, but I am actually very excited to be joined by two colleagues today for a really exciting discussion on healthcare data and technology. My name is Dylan Rosine. I'm the Millennial Public Policy Fellow in the Cybersecurity Initiative here at New America. And in my time here, I've had the great fortune of working on a number of projects. Last fall, I helped deliver a report to the United Nations Secretary General and his Chief Executives Board on various normative entry points for the UN in shaping norms around various frontier technologies. And most recently, in the topic of conversation today, I've been working on developing a series of policy recommendations around uh, healthcare cybersecurity. Um, and so I'm really excited to be joined by two folks today who are going to talk a little bit about that and generally about the promises and perils of healthcare data and technology. So I'm joined by Sonia Sarkar here on my left. Uh, Sonia is a public interest technology fellow here at New America. Um, she's also the former chief policy and engagement officer for the Baltimore City Health Department. And Sonia's work is focused on identifying the role of technology in facilitating connections between various aspects of health sectors, particularly through an equity lens. And to Sonia's left, we have Robert Lord, who is one of our cybersecurity initiative fellows here at New America, and I might add, has been really helpful and really leading the um, development of some of these policy recommendations that we're working on for the healthcare cybersecurity policy report, which he may speak to a little bit. In addition to that, Robert is a co-founder and the president of ProTennis, which is an analytics platform that leverages artificial intelligence to detect data breaches in healthcare. And he's a leading entrepreneur and thinker in the fields of artificial intelligence, cybersecurity, healthcare analytics, and data privacy. Uh, so very excited to be engaged in conversation with them really about 
one key question which we're going to be addressing on this panel today. And that key question is, how could the proliferation of healthcare data and technology both improve patient health outcomes while also exposing patients to new risks? And what can we do about it? So just for brief background, for those of you um, who are just hearing about some of these, some of these ideas today, um, the emergence of new healthcare technologies has really um, grown and uh, has been unprecedented in the past few years. Uh, after the High Tech Act was passed by Congress in 2009, we saw the tr rapid transition away from paper-based records to electronic re records in the healthcare system. Just to give you a sense of how fast that transition occurred, in 2008, only 9% of hospitals were using even the most basic electronic health record system. But by 2015, that number had soared to 96% using certified EHR technologies. So a really fast transition. In addition, we've seen connected medical devices growing at an unprecedented rate, including things like infusion pumps and pacemakers, which are connecting to each other, to your cell phone, and making it all very exciting for the possibilities that we can have um, with some of these new technologies. So with that, I want to turn to Sonia um, to talk a little bit more about some of those exciting developments um, and the possibilities that we can have in leveraging these health technologies really to deliver better patient health outcomes while in the clinic, but also before patients even step foot in the clinic in the first place. Great. Thank you, Dylan. And I, too, am working through hunger, so I understand what it's like to be at the panel uh, right before lunch. But I, you know, I, I really appreciate the conversation. And one of the things that I'm very interested in, as Dylan was referring to, is how do we think about health as beyond just the clinic walls or the hospital walls? How do we leverage technology to really address the fact that about 90% of what actually impacts our health outcomes doesn't take place through the traditional medical medical care system as we think about it, but has to do with where we go to work and how we get around and what we eat. And so one of the things that I'm really excited about and I get to play tech cheerleader today, which is not a role that I'm often in, um, is the ways in which we can leverage not only the EHR, which we've seen you know, a large proliferation and how that particular system is really being used you know, both inside of the clinic, but also to connect to systems outside of the clinic, but also other types of technologies that enable us to identify what types of social needs a patient might have. So you could imagine in a clinic in East Baltimore um, where there are significant health disparities, being able to keep a patient out of the emergency room because it's been identified that maybe they're struggling to put food on the table at the end of the month and we're able to get them enrolled in a food assistance program. They're able to connect with a local urban garden that's in their neighborhood and they're able to join uh, with food advocacy efforts in the community that are actually focusing on why those food deserts and those food disparities exist in the first place, right, which are tied to all sorts of policy issues. And so, in that vein, you could imagine that a screening tool that's identifying that that food insecurity exists in the first place, or even a module in the electronic medical record that actually shows that the patient has a food need, and then an automated referral for the patient from the clinic to an actual food bank or to that community garden could start to bring the patient along this sort of full stream of health and social services that's really relevant to their health as a person and not just as a patient that's receiving medical treatment. So I think there are a lot of excitement, a lot of exciting pieces there just in terms of the pure technology. The other sort of area where there um, is great room, I think, for us to think about how technology could be a force for good is how it actually lifts up the voice of the patient itself. So as a patient is receiving care, as they're interfacing with the healthcare system, as they're uh, actually collecting data on what's out there in the community and what types of services are out there, being able to voice their own opinions about how those services are or are not meeting their needs, and then thinking about how that information gets back to the healthcare system so that healthcare institutions can be advocates for some of those services as well. And just before we pivot to Robert to talk about the flip side of that, could you give an example of maybe something that you've seen in Baltimore working to really empower those patients to be able to take their health data and really go out there and, and, and advocate for themselves? 
Yeah, absolutely. So uh, when I was at the Baltimore City Health Department, we were very lucky to be an award uh, recipient from the Center for Medicaid and Medicare Innovation for a program called Accountable Health Communities. So this is basically the idea that we should be able to identify patient social needs, refer them to resources in the community or to government programs that actually address some of those needs, and then be able to loop back to the healthcare providers and to the healthcare system so that this information about their social history becomes part of of the standard intake, it becomes part of that standard quality of care in terms of how healthcare is being delivered. Um, so one of the things that we were very excited about on the patient side was that many of the community organizations that we started to talk to said, we want to know how we can have access to some of this aggregate data as well. So that if there are hundreds of patients in Baltimore City that are being identified as not having access to affordable housing, that's not particularly new news in Baltimore City for the people who do work around that. But if you're able to show both on the healthcare side and on the housing agency side how many of those referrals are actually getting met, what it looks like to come off and on uh, of the housing wait list, et cetera, then you actually start to get some traction and you gain some unlikely allies in the form of clinics and hospitals who may not be actively involved in housing advocacy uh, work, but now are as a way of the, the technology and the systems that they're engaging with. Thanks, Sonia. Now, Robert, I want to come to you to talk a little bit about the, the flip side of that and thinking about some of the, the perils, perhaps, of introducing new technology systems, new platforms, um, and really how those technologies can introduce new privacy and security concerns that could actually negatively impact patient health in some ways. Could you speak to that a bit? Absolutely. I'm, I'm happy to be the tech boogeyman today a little bit. Um, I was actually just at a, a talk where we were right after lunch. So this is, you know, now you guys are hangry. Before I was dealing with people in a coma, so it's a little bit of a nice switch for me personally. Um, but I, I think actually it's most, you can kind of most illustrate this point with a, a story that I had. And for a little bit of context, uh, before my co-founder Nick and I started for tennis, uh, I was a medical student. Uh, also in East Baltimore. Uh, and I, one of my real clinical interests was working with HIV positive patients. And I worked in an HIV clinic for a lot of my cl uh, clerkship time. And one of the things that I, I noticed there was that a lot of patients were very, very hesitant to be forthcoming. Um, they would ask questions like, well, where are you putting this data? Who can see this information? Um, when you're putting that into the computer, where's it going? That type of thing. And, and it really made me think, you know, I heard it a few times and I heard it over and over again. And I also saw this with psychiatric patients as well. So people who had sensitive diagnoses uh, of some sort or another. Um, and I, I really began to dig into that question and just start to ask, how are we protecting this data? What's the current state of this information? And you start to realize two really terrifying things when you just scratch the surface of that problem. The first is that the basic cybersecurity hygiene and protections that we have in healthcare are probably roughly five to 10 years behind industries where you have similarly sensitive data. I mean, really, I would say terrifying structures uh, with regard to how we protect that data from what you might think of as like a traditional external network-based attack. Um, this is improving in some ways, uh, but for a little bit of context, while comparable industries uh, probably spend about 8% of their budgets on this, uh, on this type of problem, in healthcare, we have about half a percent on budgets for, for most places, so pretty bad situation. Those numbers vary and they're, they're difficult to get, uh, but that gives you a little bit of context. The other thing that I began to realize uh, that will be intuitive if any of you happen to be clinicians or, or people who work in a medical record um, is that actually the real problem for a lot of health privacy is insiders. It's people who already have access to the electronic health record. And in healthcare, we've got two really big problems and trends. We've got one where we are opening up the data to all these different sources. We're creating all these new linkages between uh, individuals, between institutions. We've got health information exchanges. We've got increasingly interoperable systems in our communities. And that's really great. As, as a student, I saw that all the time. It, it was really important to be able to get the complete medical record. But simultaneously, there's no controls over who can access that information in almost any case. When I was a medical student, if a, let's just say, high-ranking DC VIP came into uh, my institution, there would be nothing, essentially, that stopped me from taking a look at that person's record, or likely for anyone to know that I was even in that record. So you can imagine. As a first year or as a, first as a medical, year medical student. student um, even as a volunteer, actually, working there in many cases. And this is essentially every hospital 
in the United States. So there's no exception. Uh, in fact, the place I was at was really uh, advanced in this regard, and this was still the case. And so what ended up happening was you know, my co-founder and I started to realize, hey, uh, we think that there's a much better way to do this, and that's how we embarked down that path. I, I used to be a what's, I guess, called a quant at a hedge fund, Bridgewater Associates. He used to be in the intelligence community and a, and a former Green Beret. And we said, look, you know, in finance and in national security, this can be done very differently. And that's how we ended up tackling that problem. But just to give a little bit of context of, of what you see on the ground, uh, things are getting better, but we've still got a long way to go. And that's some of the work that, that Dylan and I and, and Ian are working on right now, along with many others at New America, to try and create not just, I think, where we're focused right now, which is how do we stem the gaps and put Band-Aids on things, but actually, how do we actively articulate a more proactive vision for where our industry should be in five years uh, and, and have that be a more constructive look at the future? I think one of the questions that would strike me in thinking about how much access everyone in the ecosystem has is why. Why, why, why would a first-year medical student have access to, say, a VIP DC insider? <laughs> yeah, so it, it's a great question. And it comes down to, to two things. Um, and, there, and one's a really good reason, and one's not so good. Um, one is that there's a real culture of open collaboration in healthcare uh, that stems from two areas. One, it's, it's a very collaborative, it's a very exploratory, it's a very, I think, academic community, especially at many medical centers. And so people want that openness and sharing and teaching. Um, but then two, you've got the emergency situation problem, which is if you don't have access to an allergy when someone comes into the ED and you've got to push a particular drug and you don't know if that drug will kill someone or not, then blocking someone with traditional, say, role-based access controls is a lethal decision in a, from a cybersecurity capacity. And so essentially healthcare systems decided, look, we'd rather have the insider threat versus that person dying right there uh, while we were helpless to do anything, which was literally just look up a piece of data. So certainly the technology is there. No one would deny that. But the, the structures to do that are really hard. Um, and that gets to the second piece of it, which is we frankly just don't understand healthcare workflows well enough to permission people appropriately. So what does a nurse really do? They could be inpatient, outpatient, research. They could be in an oncology ward. They could be in the OR. All of those have completely different contexts and different types of patients that they're accessing and different ways that they're using the electronic health record. And if you think about it, um, you probably have the equivalent of millions of different roles in a healthcare system, even if there's tens of thousands of people. And so a lot of your basic security paradigms for protecting data inside an institution just completely fall apart, um, which is why kind of more advanced analytics are, are coming about as an alternative to that approach that are more behavior-based. It, it's clear to me, hearing from both of you, that there's a balance to be struck in taking advantage of and leveraging these technologies to improve patient health outcomes while being mindful of the risks that they introduce. So rather than have you, one of you play the cheerleader and one of you play the boogeyman, can you think through sort of critically where that balance is and how we can be mindful of the risks while also leveraging the technologies at the same time? Yeah, I think one of the things that really resonates about your story, Robert, is as we were planning for the accountable health communities work, uh, we had convened a coalition of multiple social service providers, multiple healthcare providers, and often I think when you're uh, in the direct work of patient patient care delivery or service delivery, there's a sense that the more you know about the person in front of you, the better you'll be able to do your work. Right. So if you have the whole set of data that could possibly be out there, more is better. And you know, that's kind of the overriding philosophy that comes to uh, really sort of run the design of the intervention and things like that. But as we were having a conversation, there was a representative from House of Ruth, Maryland, um, which is an organization that does a lot of work around domestic violence and um, you know, is very invested in the idea of really defining how, what it looks like to um, provide information safely and how to protect women from potentially being exposed um, to you know, former abusers or current abusers within a system. And she asked the same question you did, which is really, you know, why are we collecting this data and how are we actually ensuring that the right levels of protection are in place to ensure that the right data is getting to the right people. And so as we think about issues of consent, as we think about issues of um, really sort of, you know, making things available only when they're needed, um, for me, there's a very large incentive to actually talk to patients and stakeholders directly 
um, and you know, find out from them what they would view as appropriate and really sort of give that equal weight with the subject matter experts or the technical experts that are often in these rooms. Yeah, I, I would really echo that patient involvement side of things. I, I would maybe even take it a step further and say that I think we need to start having mechanisms of transparency where consumers can re consumers of healthcare, I should say, should really be able to uh, understand what the cybersecurity and privacy posture is of the institutions that are, they're going to entrust their data with, right? Trust is a two-way street, and if we don't have that transparency, you're basically, I mean, everyone here has gone into uh, some form of doctor's office or something, and, and basically they say, here, let me give you a stack of 10 papers that you're gonna sign, essentially giving all the rights away to every one of the most sensitive pieces of data that might be in your life, unless you've undergone like a top secret SCI clearance. That's basically the only thing you can, I can think of that's more invasive than a medical record for many individuals. Um, and so when, when you think about that, it's all about, okay, well, what are you gonna give me back, institution? What technologies are you using? What cultural elements are you using to protect my information? And, and I think that is a, is a huge piece that we, can, that we can implement. I think a second thing is, and I see this a lot, I've been a clinical researcher as well, we always talk about, and I know we're talking about AI and all these other technologies and, and buzzwords that have lost all meaning to me at this point, uh, having been in the field for a decade now. Um, but we always talk about these technologies in terms of how are we using the data to improve outcomes and to uh, do more clinically focused analytics. But a lot of those same tools can also be used to protect data in a variety of different ways. And I think we just need to have a, a parallel track of investment and thoughtfulness about how we're using these kind of sophisticated techniques to defend our institutions as well as we are using them to uh, implement improvements to, to patient care, which should come first, I agree, but, but really does have to happen in parallel. So it's looking like we have about time for one more question. And unfortunately, there's no Q&A for this panel, but we're going to go to lunch. And I encourage you all to um, stick around and, and ask those questions to all of us, certainly, but the others who came before. Um, the final question that I have relates back to um, Emma Coleman and Depaim Ghosh's panel about bringing technologists to the table. And so I'm wondering if you can speak a little bit more concretely about bringing technologists into the healthcare space and encouraging those collaborative dialogues between patients, technologists, policymakers, how we leverage public-private conversations to really deliver the best outcomes. And um, maybe if you've seen an example of that in your own work, Sonia or Robert, um, if you can speak to what that looks like in helping deliver the best patient health outcomes. Yeah, I think it's a great question. We were talking earlier about the fact that oftentimes there isn't a great understanding amongst technologists of healthcare workflows. And I'd flip that and say that similarly, there's often a, a great sort of lack of understanding of technology in general, but then certainly the way that technology gets incorporated into actual healthcare workflows amongst public health professionals and healthcare providers themselves. And so one of the things that I have found to be incredibly useful is to, from an equity perspective, think about how to bring technologists to the table in a way that really is in a mode of learning and not just in a mode of saying we're the sort of you know we're the people who know how to design and code and we're here to fix your problems which can often be the sort of positioning of some of these types of um, conversations and instead to say everyone's got different assets that they're bringing to the table and I found that to be incredibly useful I'm not a technologist myself but I really enjoyed getting to learn from the other technologists in the public interest technology fellowship who have helped me to break down some of the pieces of the policy questions that I'm looking at and then think about how technology could be applied against that. Yeah, you know, I, I always think about it, having been in health IT specifically for about the last five years, as it's really a, a two-part problem. Um, and I think that it requires a bridging of the gaps between two mindsets. On the, on the healthcare side, there is very much a culture of no that has emerged around technology. And it's all about, okay, Let's protect patients, let's protect patients so we can't do something new, we're gonna do it the way we've always done it. This is beginning to shift in some ways, but we need to start thinking about the long term, which is if we're really gonna protect our populations and the long term health of our nation, we can't do it the way that we've always done it. And so I think we need to move into that shift of from a no all the time into a yes but, let's be thoughtful. And I think that that's a really important cultural shift inside of medicine. Simultaneously, I have a lot of friends uh, on a certain coast that uh, when they go into healthcare are often just focused on like, let me just disrupt whatever I can. I'm here to disrupt. I'm just disruption as a service today, right now. And 
I was talking to a healthcare CIO, uh, we, uh, we were at this conference, and he said, the last thing I want to hear is someone is going to disrupt my hospital, okay? <laughs> Just, you, that is not a word you want in a clinical workflow. Does a surgeon want disruption in their OR? No. Um, and so I think we just have to start to think about the nomenclature that we use and the thoughtfulness and the ways that we're entering that space as technologists and being respectful both of the cultural norms as well as the unique challenges because there are elements to that that are definitely playing the entrepreneurship game on, on expert mode or the policy game or, or other pieces of that. And I think we, we just both need to come to that understanding uh, and concordance. And I think it's events like this that are helping to build uh, those bridges that are just so, so important. Well, I hope you'll join me in thanking Sonia Sarkar and Robert Lord for being here. Thank you, Dylan. Thanks, everyone. And congratulate yourself on making it to lunch. Um, I believe lunch is served out in the lobby, so um, save those questions. We'll be back in here at 1.30. Thanks. <laughs>